Hello, my name is Lily Cass and I am the scholar in residence at Opera Philadelphia. I use she, her, and hers pronouns. And for those with varying vision levels, I am a white woman in my 30s with long brown hair and green eyes. I'm wearing a red dress and I'm sitting in front of a green wall with a large bookshelf. And depending on how I'm sitting, uh, you can see Shakespeare or Borges um, behind me on the book covers, like them watching over me. Um, I'm excited to welcome you all to this continuation of the Reflection and Revision series, which was created by Opera Philadelphia's Vice President of Community Initiatives, my wonderful colleague, Veronica Chapman Smith. This series is designed to look deeper into the opera genre by exploring its musical and theatrical elements, as well as cultural, social, and historical perspectives. Today, our topic is Women in Opera, Voices Transcending Bodies, a topic that emerged from Opera Philadelphia's engagement with Verdi's Rigoletto this spring for our forthcoming production. I am delighted to have with us today three amazing artists with a wealth of knowledge on this subject. We have Dr. Naomi Andre, a scholar of women's studies, opera, and African and Afro-American studies, Arya Umizawa, an opera stage director and innovator, and Karen Slack, a sought after soprano and artistic advisor. It is so difficult to sum up the many incredible things that the three of you do in one short sentence. Um, so I'll ask you all, uh, could you please introduce yourselves as well and share the vantage points from which you will be engaging with this topic of women in opera? Naomi, would you like to begin? Sure. My last name is Andre, so I should be used to going, you know, near the beginning. My name is Naomi Andre, and I am a professor at the University of Michigan, and I have training as a musicologist. However, my appointments are in the um, Department of Afro-American African Studies, and I'm in my office right now for that. Also, I have a joint appointment in Women's and Gender Studies and in the Residential College in the Arts and Ideas and the Humanities Program. I am a musicologist who thinks a lot about opera in traditional spaces, such as the Opera House here in the US and Europe, as well as opera houses in South Africa, as well as operas in prisons. So operas, I say where we normally think of operas and in places where we might not normally think of operas. I've written about opera and race and gender and other intersectional identities. For those who are um, have vision um, challenges, I am a light black woman with um, long sister locks. I am wearing a black and white shirt with a red necklace. I have glasses and I'm sitting in my office with a bookcase behind me. Terrific. Aria, would you like to go next? Yes, thank you so much for having me today. Um, my name is Aria Umazawa. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm calling in today from uh, Toronto, Ontario. It was known as Takaranto. It's a uh, Anishinaabe word for the place in the water where the trees are standing. It's Treaty 13 territory. Um, let's see, things about me. Oh, um, I am a mixed race, half Japanese, half Caucasian woman uh, with like lightish red straight hair. Um, I'm wearing a black sweater and I'm sitting by a Chinese evergreen sitting by a painting of another tree, um, species unknown. <laughs> um, and let's see a little bit about myself. I'm a stage director by training. I work professionally as a stage director at opera companies around North America. Um, I'm very excited to be coming to Opera Philadelphia in September to direct Toshio Hosokawa's The Raven. Um, I'm also a producer here in Toronto. My organization, Amplified Opera, uh, has a mandate to place artists at the center of public discourse. So we engage artists that we think have really unique, really exciting perspectives, and we empower them to tell stories on their own terms. Um, so that is sort of the lens that I'm bringing here today, both as someone who travels to work for other organizations and through my own organization attempts to help uh, empower artists to tell stories that feel authentic to their experience and in a and create in a way that feels generative and positive and empowered. 
Thank you. That's so important. Karen, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Karen Slack. I'm a soprano on the operatic stage, the concert stage, the recital stage, the church house, and everywhere else. <laughs> um, there is a stage to sing on. Um, I'm originally from Philadelphia. I live in Philadelphia still as we speak. I'm here. Um, I am a Black woman. Uh, uh, I guess you could say a brown skinned black woman. I have very large red frames uh, that I rock now more than I'd like to because <laughs> I wear glasses pretty consistently now. Um, I have long, uh, natural Afro kinky hair. Um, I am sitting in my wonderful comfy chair between my fireplace and my bookshelf that has two copies of Dr. Andre's book, which I so proudly, I'm still trying to, I'm still trying to get through Dr. Dave, <laughs> but I have two copies and I'm hoping to give it away to some lucky person that I know real soon. Um, I, uh, through my advocacy work, I have become an administrator at the Portland Opera where I advise and at the BAMF Center. I'm very proud of the work in Canada as well, um, uh, advocating for singers and teaching artists, advocating for artists, not just singers, you know, very, very, um, uh, through my work, I, I have understood that it is important to advocate for everyone who is in the space and not just your group, your people, but that advocacy work is, is an arc. It is not just these destination points. So yes, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you all sitting here listening to everything that you do. And I already knew everything that you do, but just hearing you all say it, I'm just completely starstruck and can't believe that I'm in this <laughs> Zoom room with all of you. I, I can't wait to, to hear what you have to say on this topic today. Um, so I thought I'd start with kind of a, a large question that will allow us to kind of delve into individual examples and then kind of expand out from there. Um, so you can just think about this question in general, take whatever parts of this question you'd like and, and run with them. But I'm curious, what female role in the repertoire have you wrestled with writing about, talking about, or presenting on stage for audiences? So part of this is what were the problems you saw as inherent in the role or the ways that it has been presented in the past? Did you end up understanding it or making it work? Or are you still just as confused as when you started? Um, and if you did end up understanding it, I'd be interested in hearing how, how you worked through your problems with the role. Um, and also whether you think your personal eventual understanding translated to the audience um, and how you think that works. Um, you know, as a, I've struggled with, a lot of uh, female characters in the repertoire. I think both because, um, both as an audience member for the way that they're presented on stage, um, talking to other audience members who come in with a preconceived understanding of who these characters are and what their arcs are supposed to be, and most specifically what the takeaway should be about these characters. Um, and then similarly, when in the rehearsal room working, I struggle a lot with, um, because there's such a history of performance practice baked into a lot of the canonical titles, um, actually convincing, you know, convincing or encouraging artists and all collaborators on all sorts of angles to come with me on a journey where we maybe ch challenge the interpretation that we've been given. Um, and there, so there's too many to name, <laughs> um, but I think one really, uh, one that really stuck out, stuck out for me was uh, Georgetta from Il Tabaro, um, which is not necessarily one that everybody sort of knows. I think if you know Il Tabaro, all you say to yourself is like, it's a big sing for big singers. Um, and you don't really think too deeply about what happens. Um, and people don't look very kindly on Georgetta because she cheats on her husband Michele with Luigi and you meet both, both men. Um, but I was sort of, I was reading the script and I realized like not, not a year before she 
we meet her in the opera, she loses a child, her first child, in what sounds like a really traumatic and devastating kind of way. And she even says, quite interestingly, halfway through, she just has this big love scene with Luigi, her lover, and she says after he leaves, why is it so difficult to be happy? And so there's like a lot of just like, as soon as I hear that music, just so, so much compassion that comes out for this woman who's clearly really struggling. And like, how do you repair it? The question I put to the singers when we were working with this was like, how do you repair something that's so broken? Like this, this person is just like suffering so hard and doesn't really understand what she needs to move past this really devastating, this really devastating point in her life. Um, and I even argued with the dramaturg I was working on, who was like, no, 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 that's because her husband's just a jerk. And I was like, no, no, I'm, I think maybe <laughs> she's, I think maybe she's just not, she's depressed. And I think rightly so. And I think she's looking for any, anything, anything that makes her feel um, better. And this person came back and did say, after thinking about it, they were like, on the drive home, I thought about it and I realized you were right. And I was like, yeah permission to move ahead so anyway all this to say um we put the show up and one of the big biggest pieces of feedback and maybe the best feedback I've ever received was audience members who were like just exactly what you would picture a lifelong opera fan to look like coming up to me and saying I never realized this show was so sad and I was like oh well <laughs> it ends in murder so even just on the face of it, um, it's sad. But if you really think about what happens to the, what happened to this couple, then you realize how devastating the story is. Um, and we look much kinder on the character of Georgetta, who has every reason, every reason to behave in the way she's behaving, even if we might not like agree with it from a values perspective. But it's logical and it's human and it's messy and all of these things. So um, yeah. Too many to name, but if I had to, that was one where working through the opera changed how I changed my complete understanding of that show. Thank you so much. That I I haven't thought for too long about that particular character, and it makes me want to just immediately jump jump into looking at that opera, and, and that seems like a really great um, kind of you know revelation that you had about the character's backstory that's you didn't even have to make up right it wasn't even subtext it was it was in the libretto but um people had passed over it um in other productions thank you um who wants to go next I'll jump in because I want to say thank you for giving that background. I think of Tritico with um, Tabaro as sort of the unknown. We, you know, most opera folks know Gianni Schicchi. It's the fun one. It gets performed a lot and it, it is funny and it's great. And um, Suor Angelica is, you know, beautiful for women's voices. And But Tabaro is sort of the unknown, sort of weird, dark one. And I had no idea, and I knew it involved this infidelity. And I thought, well, you know, it's just late 19th, early, you know, 20th century. And so it's, um, you know, that verismo, people are doing crazy things. But to have you read that so carefully and like, wait a minute, there's like a child that's been lost, how that shapes our characters. It's sort of an interesting segue to the character I want to talk about because um, as somebody, I wrote a dissertation on Giuseppe Verdi and I was looking at women's roles and I was interested in the roles of um, the mezzos or the second other, the non-main soprano. So I'm Neris and Aida and Eboli and Don Carlos and um, Azucena and Trovatore. And so, and these are women who do strange things. We see, you know, them not always the most um, beautiful and acting well, but, you know, they're very interesting characters. But the character I had a lot of trouble with, especially when I was teaching, is um, Gilda and Rigoletto because her music is gorgeous. The opera works really well. It's part of Verdi's middle trilogy where his operas, you know, he's done a lot of earlier works in the 40s and with Regaletto and Trovatore and Traviata, they're still, you know, performed 
a lot today. And, you know, Violetta we love and she's, you know, has a heart of gold and ends up being the most moral person in there. Azucena is somebody who I think she's going through this sort of post-traumatic stress syndrome with horrors that have happened similarly to, you know, what happened before the opera began as she somehow throws a baby into the fire. I mean, pretty horrible stuff. But Gilda seems to be this character of, oh my gosh, she's sort of the ultimate victim. And after looking at her and thinking about her, there's a moment in the opera that really helped me see her in a different way. And it's in the third act where we have, everybody talks about the quartet in Rigoletto, when you've got sort of these two embodied duets with the Duke and Madalena inside the tavern and Gilda and her father outside. And yet the voices all do this wonderful duet and trio and quartet texture. But what I, when I was teaching that, and it's like, okay, you know, let's talk about the quartet. But then if you continue it on, you have a trio where we have um, the Duke has gone up to bed and you've got Sparo Fucile and Maddalena, um, Rigoletto's gone and it's um, Gilda on the outside. Gilda's supposed to be going off to, you know, like Rigoletto said, see, the Duke is really terrible. So now you dress as a guy and go to Verona. But Gilda loves this guy and it's not smart for her to love him, especially when he's, you know, seduced her, he's known for doing this. And even if she thinks she was, you know, the special one, she's just seen him seduce Madalena. And yet we find out, I mean, we know that in the beginning of the opera, she's kind of new in town. She had been living with her mother. Her mother has died. She's now in a new place. And she was seduced by the Duke. And she is bringing her best self to him, even if he's not doing that for her. And so rather than seeing her as a sap, sort of like, oh, isn't she just naive? What I love in the trio that follows, because the trio is like where all the action is. One day I want to write about this because the um, quartet gets lots of attention, but it's very static. The people outside stay outside, the people inside stay inside. Whereas with the trio, you have Madeleine and Sparo Fucile inside, Gilda's outside, there's a storm that's you know, getting you know, bigger and crazier. And Gilda listens and she hears Madalena says, you know, I kind of like the Duke. Why do we have to sacrifice him? And Sparo Fucile says, you know, I'm a man of my honor. I, I owe a body. <laughs> and, you know, they sort of go on and Gilda's like, oh my gosh, you know, I love this guy. I don't want anything to happen to him. And she hears that Sparo Fucile says, okay, if somebody happens to come in, I can kill them instead. And so I can, you know, live up. <laughs> He's a man of honor. He needs to, to give a body. And so Gilda hears this and she makes a decision. And never in the opera up to that point has she ever made a decision. She's always, people show up, people, she's kidnapped and brought to the court. You know, she's always a pawn. Whereas here she's deciding what she wants and she's doing it because of what she believes. Now, I think she makes the wrong decision. I do not think this is a good thing to do. However, it gives her a little more agency. I'm still working it out. She's still a tough character in my mind, but to see a character on her own terms do something for something she believes, even if she doesn't, if I don't agree with it, there's like, that's character development. That's doing something a little different and she's got the most incredible music doing it and um, that trio just has so much energy it's so kinetic and she goes from outside to inside and just everything is exciting and it pairs beautifully with the quartet so Gilda's my um, sort of the woman I I love to hate I hate to love I I hate and love the my bittersweet ca character who I just overall really love Thank you so much. Yeah, sometimes we we're drawn to characters kind of against our our will in, in a certain way. Um, and it's great to think through that with with Gilda. Karen, who would you choose as a problematic woman in the repertoire that you've wrestled with? 
Well, you know, it's so it's so many. I mean, for, for singers, you just have to sing what you get hired to sing or what your well, the repertoire of your voice fits. So it's difficult to say, I wrestle with this character, but you don't actually, you know, ever get the opportunity to to sing those the role. But um for me, it's yes, I can say roles like because I always feel so conflicted about suicide and opera for women. I'm like, I wouldn't take poison for him. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's so, it's, that's where I feel the most con uh, conflicted. It's when I have to sing to, um, Leonora and Trovatore. Like, why, girl? You know, you don't even know this guy. You say, I saw him from afar and I fell in love with him. Like the idea of these kind of um, fairy tale situations. And then by the end, you're on the floor dying. <laughs> <laughs> for the tenor mostly, you know, or roles like Liu, where she takes her own life, or Aida, where she's in the tomb waiting for him, you know, I mean, for me, and all roles that, I, that I've sung, you know, um, those are complicated um, women to, 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 as Karen, not as the storyteller, my idea, my, I have to commit to whatever um, I'm bringing to, you know, when, whatever Aria and I decide is going to be for this production is what the story that I have to tell at that point. But Karen has a whole other idea of the kind of woman, you know, that's why I love new work. You know, that's why I love having the agency of creating and to being able to tell the stories that I like to tell. I do like that part. But um, then you have the roles like Bess uh in roles where you you feel conflicted because you have to so you feel like you have to you have to want you want the audience to like you in the end and so then you have those kind of roles where you're just like please like me please like me you know and 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 also the audience has one idea of who they think she is and what like the who what where when why how someone gets to the point where you know they are you know roles like best you know what i mean or way wayward women type of roles or someone like a Carmen, you know, versus a Michaela, you know. So for me, though, though that is the conflict as a storyteller is to is the is the suicide, why, why we die, and also the also the part of like bad girls and the idea that you have to try to get the audience to be on your side is a conflict as a performer. And you know, interesting, there was a company that wanted me to sing the foreign princess in Rusalka. And of course, I want to sing Rusalka, but they, you know, wanted me for the foreign princess. And I'm like, first of all, no, I'm not going to make my debut in. A, I didn't want a, them to see a black woman uh, <laughs> with this role as the, the 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 cursing this this innocent couple, and you know, and in all of the times that we're in right now, I was like, no, I don't, I don't want to, to be seen like that. That's not the kind of repertoire that I want to sing and that's not the kind of career that I have. So it, it just, it, it, so yeah, so there's a lot of different layers to what I'm saying. So not necessarily one character, but it is like these archetypes that I struggle, I struggle with. Thank you so much. There's so much to un unpack in there, but issues of representation um, and separating Karen from from the role um, and, and thinking of it that way, it's it's really fascinating. Thank you. I wonder if maybe we could talk because in several of your responses, um, you mentioned characters um, struggling with mental health issues, right? That we view quite differently today than when these operas were written. Um, and a very common trope in operas is the mad scene, which is usually for a woman, right? Um, so a female character, for lack of a better term, goes crazy on stage, right? Has has a has a mad scene. Famous examples include Elvira and Ipuritani, Ophelia and Hamlet, um, and of course the probably the most famous is Lucia and Lucia de la Mermore. Um, and in these moments, characters seem to be having trouble organizing their thoughts. They often have trouble telling the difference between fantasy and reality, um, which is difficult to, to tell the difference between an opera anyway, but, but extra special difference between fantasy and reality. Um, and so there's the character is struggling with that, but we in the audience at these moments um, often hear 
the most glorious music in the opera or the most intense music in the opera with lots of usually like coloratura virtuosic singing. Um, so there's again this separation between what the singer has to do, which is probably the, the hardest thing that, that the singer needs to do in the whole opera, what the character is going through, which is a mental health issue, and um, also what the audience is getting, which is usually like intense enjoyment and, and kind of like a wow factor from this, this virtuosic singing. Um, so I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on this kind of in general um, and thinking about how it's almost like when a female character has a mental break on stage, that's when her full voice is released. Um, this idea that the, the most amazing music comes from this mental break. Um, and thinking through why are there so many mad scenes for women in opera? What does this do to the repertoire? Because men are... <laughs> They want to always lean on the part that the women are, are um, hormonal and emotional and all these things. And of course, you know, sexism, you know, all of the patriarchy, all of the things, you know, it's interesting. I was I was um, I just finished doing a run of Aida and um, I'm always like Verdi is the king of I had 20 more minutes of the hardest singing you have to do all night. You know, um, he waits to the, the act four for this day, Mona, who has the most of the biggest emotional arc. It's not even about dramatic singing. You know, it is about the emotional arc or Aida where she has to float all these big B, high B flats, you know, and uh, it's just or yeah, you know, like it's the, the, the that for, for the Verdi women, it is the dying that you have, you know, the, the last of Violetta, you know, the last breath is spent on the most, uh, some of the most glorious music in opera, you know, um, I, I'm curious as to hear what you two have to say, you know, I don't, I don't sing mad scenes, I haven't had the opportunity to sing a lot of bel canto, but when I, when I um, see Ana Bolena, you know, and that, that last scene is just, I mean, it, it, I'm, I, I can't even speak about it when I see it and I, and I hear it. It is, it's just in, incredible. Like I, it's kind of sucks that they do that to us. <laughs> I love your point there. I say that last scene is dope. That's pretty yeah. incredible. <laughs> it's like, what just happened here? I, I mean, yeah. Brilliant. But anyway, I'll, I'll let you all get out of the I'll get out of the way. But I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. Oh, Karen, I think you've already said something because you helped me see. I think you're right. And it's your experience of the roles you've sung. Yes, there's the Lucia and there's sort of the light mad or the Primalto Cento, sort of the early 19th century mad scene. But you're right that there's usually some sort of unleashing of the voice at the very end. And your examples with even somebody who we don't think of as being mad like Desdemona but, or Aida or this really precarious, difficult um, singing for the soprano at the end. It's almost like the mad scene has become a trope where your voice is going, you know, you, you have a little of that uh, sort of vulnerability, precariousness, desperation, hysteria, even if you, you keep all your wits about you. <laughs> so that is really an interesting point. I think um, just a, an interesting thing when I've talked about women and gender in mad scenes, the construction of madness in the 19th century, um, and even going back earlier, is this idea of sort of the word hysterical, which is connected to sort of this idea of a uterus and how this hysteria or uterus is kind of in, in women and it sort of pops out in sort of madness at different times. I'm not doing a stunning job of explaining it, but there is something about women are just more naturally prone to losing control. And it's true, it's usually women, not exclusively. There's some early, like Orlando Furioso is an example in the 18th century coming from the Tasso. But, um, and then I think um, an interesting example is Peter Grimes in 1945, the Benjamin Britten, where we have a, a man whose manhood is somehow under question. 
and he goes mad at the end. And we don't really know what the situation is between his connection with these young boy apprentices and what that means in 1945, and also with Benjamin Britten and Peter Pierce, their own relationship. I mean, there's all this stuff encoded into what it could have meant in that time and then what it means today. I think madness and having women particularly sort of be freed and unleashed and sort of also put through the dozens, so to speak, you know, it's, um, it's an interesting question rather than, oh, isn't there an aesthetic element in all the beauty? I wonder what it's like. I, I so appreciate hearing you talk about what it's like as you're singing. What is it like, and I don't want to put you on the spot, Aria, but in terms of who decides what people do on stage, giving some direction for how do we show this um, voice that takes over, so to speak? Well, I mean, I, I think I'll just keep building on what both you and Karen have said, which is that, you know, I do think in, in a somewhat problematic way, um, in, a, in a problematic way, not somewhat problematic way, but these moments of, there's, there is a moment of break. And the way I sort of view it is like, this is when the truth comes out, even if it comes out in metaphor. The, whatever the person's been holding on to in their heart, whatever they're afraid of, whatever they're, um, whatever they've observed that they haven't been allowed to tell. So oftentimes you'll find references or side references to the fact that maybe they understood they were being manipulated. Um, you'll find references to this is this is the life I was living, and then something of danger came in and upset that. And what what irks me when I see, what enrages me personally when I see these on stage is when um, madness is played as played as just fanciful craziness and they're just crazy and they're beautiful through their crazy. And I think it, it belies a certain um, gross mentality towards the mentally ill, first of all, um, I think, you know, and, and mental health in general. But I think when I work on mad seeds and I haven't done a, a whole ton, the exercise becomes like, what, do, what is this line saying that's true? Like, what is the truth that needs to be said here that couldn't be said because societal factors, manipulation, general mess couldn't come out. And so then we had this like breaking point and now the truth is coming out and we, the audience might not understand it because we're not literally in the head of this character, but this character is speaking their truth right now um, and needs, and like, let's make sure that in some way, at least the feeling of that is understood in this moment um, and try and come at it that way. Because I just, I find too often we see very simplistic, like reducing women to childlike behavior and their madness, reducing uh, people who are mad to sort of like uh, very frantic, kinetic behavior, like frantic, frenetic behavior that just um, is play playing of, it's clowning madness. It's not actually any sort of like nuanced, thoughtful representation. Um, and so that's sort of like when I, when I am working on those scenes, that, that is what I try to do with, with singers is say like, what's happened so far? What do these, what are these lines in reference to? She might be singing about flowers, but what are these flowers, what do these flowers symbolically reference? Who could she be talking about? Or, you know, whoever the character is at the time, like, and can we, can we find the thread of truth that goes through this entire scene? I just have to jump in there and say, that is brilliant. I love this idea of truth. I mean, this is, I just love these conversations because I, I like this idea that I was picking up from Karen where the voice is unleashed in a way, even if, so the convention of writing a mad scene for a woman's voice, sometimes you don't even need the madness, but there's something that's happening vocally. But then this idea of what is the truth coming out? And it makes me think of Angelica, where at the end, sometimes I've seen that scene played as though she's going mad and sort of is sort of envisioning, you know, going to heaven or something. But I think a really powerful interpretation is that there's a truth that she can't really speak. Yeah, I and why it's not just is the woman a victim or is she empowered in the madness, but it's much more complicated to that than that and more interesting. Yeah, I, I wonder if you, is madness, how, how madness is treated when women, I mean, when men go mad in opera. 
like I was just thinking about I haven't been in the operas where the men go mad. Um, but I'm I'm well, I mean Don Giovanni at the end when he's going to hell, I guess. I guess. Oh, that could be oh, madness. My. He deserved it. So, you know. <laughs> right. We look at it as this is the truth. Yeah. Yeah, exa- exactly. But I'm I'm curious how you how you um if you what role like that could that could, you know, that I could go, ah, okay. Because it's it's handled very differently. Tom Rakewell at the end of the Rake's progress goes mad as well, um, and uh, actually, that's one of the. Um, and True Love is one of those characters who really fascinates me because she sort of she lives the trope for most of the opera and then she breaks it right at the very end, which is like a very exciting. <laughs> I wonder what happens off stage with Anne True Love all the time, um, mm. but uh, but no, I think. Um, I think I and I haven't looked at that scene in so long, so I, I can't really I can't really say, but sort of the regret for the regret of how he's behaved comes out. Um, that he's cast himself as Adonis and, and true love as Venus um, at the end there has a lot of significance, sort of in terms of like what has been lost, who, you know who he thought he was and then what he was confronted with at the end of his story. So I think I I would personally treat it the same way, but I know that that is not necessarily the case um, along a lot of a lot of people. I know our takeaway at the end is supposed to be like, oh, that's so sad that he treated and true love like a jerk the whole time. And then she leaves him at the end. Like, how could she leave him? I'm like, um, sh- <laughs> like, there's not a lot left there (laughs) um but in terms of his mad his madness and what he's expressing there um i think it i would i would at least go through the same exercise uh, with the singer yeah but when the fall goes mad his is not because he's going mad or you know when he goes into the room to stab her to murder her it's not these big high flashy kind of big dramatic it is that you really, even the last word, you hear him, oh, you hear him sigh. You know what I mean? Like you yeah. that's the part of like, you're feeling bad for this guy who even by his own circumstance, right? It, you know, in the society that he was in, be, you know, that's a whole other conversation around, you know, uh, around being the only one, you know, the only person of color and being, a, you know, a, 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 in a in a, a leadership leader, you know, type of situation, whatever. Anyway, that's the whole other thing. But like, even in the end, like he gets the last breath, the last sigh, the last, you know, he, he dies in a way where there's empathy. That's a, a, boy, these are such interesting ideas because in the mad scenes, we sometimes think of quotations from earlier on and you get the baccio theme, the kiss theme from the end of the first act love duet and that comes back you know where it's just so poignant it feels as though these characters become incredibly sort of I'm thinking of Tom Rakewell sort of simple almost like childlike and transparent and vulnerable however if we and Otello you know he's um there's a certain sort of vulnerability, even though he's just done something horrible. He's so, I find him so um, sympathetic. And like, cause we know he's not the bad guy here, even though he's probably seen as the bad guy. And I've written about how Otello and being sort of hit the more and the blackness, sort of this latent thing that's coming out of him. Like, okay, we knew that you being the valiant guy was just kind of a show, but you're really, you know, you've got this dark heart and now you're doing your true self. I think of Peter Grimes and his madness seems to be unpredictable and it's sort of frightening and there's sort of a violence, which is caught in there. And I like the fact that we're talking about men's mad scenes here <laughs> rather than the aestheticized, you know, beautiful woman who's totally harmless and she's, you know, singing beautiful music and isn't that fascinating to consume with our ears and our eyes. I think there is an element of truth that comes out. I really like that for looking at madness. Do you guys know La Finta Jardiniera by Mozart? It's an early, it's an early work, and I 
I think it's underperformed. I, I would love to see more productions of La Fita Giardiniera because I think it's just so fascinating. There's actually a double mad scene in La Finta Giardiniera for a woman and a man at the same time. Oh, uh, Yolante and Belfiore. And I really wonder whether Stravinsky was inspired by this in some way for the Rake's mm. Progress because they also, as they go mad, think that they are uh, populating ancient Greek myths. Um, yeah, yeah, they like call call themselves uh, different names, just just like in in Tom Rakewell's um, Mad Scene. Um, and what I wonder is, in the context of La Finta Giardiniera, it's a comedy, which is we yeah. haven't really been talking about comedies, but it's supposedly a comedy. Um, lots of silly things happen and the madness is kind of like a a spoof of a mad scene oh. in a certain way um just like there is in uh, Britain's Midsummer Night's Dream um with the Pyramus and Thisbe there's a um a spoof of the Lucia mad scene um so in comic operas mad madness can be can be spoofed or, or parodied um but in this comedy, La Finta Giardiniera, the entire plot is predicated on an act of domestic violence. Um, and Violante, the woman who is the pretend gardener, um, has been attacked by her husband um, or fiance or suitor or something like that, Belfiore. And he thinks that he has killed her. And then he sees her again as this pretend gardener and he thinks he's gone crazy because oh. she insists that she's not the same person. But so it's this whole comedy, but predicated on this very serious act of domestic violence. Um, so I, I would really like to, to talk about violence against women in opera as well. And because I think this is part of what causes the mad scenes or, or causes the, the breakdown um, is, I mean, so much happens to, to women in opera. So about the violence against women that seems to sometimes cause these breakdowns. I mean, it's, it's no surprise that women break down in opera because so many terrible things happen to women in opera. Um, so I thought maybe we could, we could address that. There's so much misogyny in opera um, and women in opera are often in danger for their lives and are often killed by their partners. There's domestic violence. Um, there's also a lot of sexualized, sexual violence in opera um, that sometimes occurs on stage, such as in Missy Mazzoli's Breaking the Waves, um, but more often occurs off stage, allowing even like um, supposedly factual documents like synopses to kind of leave out or kind of tone down what has happened off stage because we don't see it. Um, so I'm wondering, um, especially since all of you participate in a sort of opera activism um, in, in your own fields, what do we as opera scholars and opera practitioners working today, especially in the wake of the Me Too movement, but um, really always, what do we do with the fact that the operatic canon perpetually showcases violence against women and even makes it kind of beautiful for the audience to watch, right? Like we, we sit there and enjoy the opera, but also we're watching horrible things happen to women on stage. Um, so I wonder if you think there are any um, interventions that we that we can make or that we should be making um, as we continue to perform the same repertoire over and over again and see these women hurt on stage in various ways over and over again. I guess I'll, I guess I can start with this one. I I feel like that might make a lot of that might be the logical place to start. <laughs> Um, as as a as a stage director and and as with my producing experience as well I have a great colleague Jamie Martino is the general director of Tapestry Opera and we went to a show once that she described in a way that I just like took right to heart she said that was it was a Carmen and she said it was traditional to the point of being reckless 
So the violence that was presented on stage was completely unquestioned. The exoticism, the racism that was on stage, completely unquestioned. It was just sort of thrown out there as like, this is what Carmen is. Um, and I will say it was like, if, if we take that traditional to the point of being reckless lens off the, sh the show, it was fine. Like it was the show, it was Carmen. Um, but I, I kind of carry that with me now when I think about how to, to both view and work on these shows, that there needs to be an element of criticism um, that and some these any of these elements should go, should be addressed. Like, especially if we're, um, if we're presenting to this to the public and we're saying to the public, like, this is something that's worthy of your attention. Um, we are not-for-profit charitable organizations. I take that designation very seriously and think that when we put shows out, there should be some kind of service or value add to the community. And I think recklessly putting, sh putting shows that are recklessly traditional out there and saying that the value is in cultural preservation, um, sort of like, raises my eyebrow up to its brow line. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so I think, you know, interventions can come in in a, a number of ways. It can either be by trying to actually get into the story and change the story in some way and re completely rewrite and frame. The opera world gets really spooked about that because, um, the the sanctity of the score is such that like even even really small changes or even changes like I proposed to one opera company and Madame a Butterfly that we just stop 30 seconds from the end and say we don't think this is a show we should present or we don't think we should present this show this way and that would be how the opera ended and I was like you'll get 99 percent of the score it's just the last 30 seconds I'm proposing we cut and we just have an announcement that's like no no more <laughs> This was like very spooky and it has been spooky to every company I've brought it up to since. Um, and I totally get it. Like I work in opera. I understand that that is like the supremely scary thing. They're like, you, well, then after the announcement, would you finish it? <laughs> I'd be like, no, that's not the concept. Um, but anyway, so like that, there's like an actual get in there and like rip up the score kind of intervention. Or there's like, I borrow from I borrow from liter the world of literature when I say like paratextual interventions. So you can add framings around the story that might point to the things we're trying to criticize, like bring forward, tease forward and call out. Um, but what regardless, I feel like there should be some kind of intervention from the stage director's part. Otherwise, I sort of wonder why why we're seeing this a hundred years later if if there's no, if there's nothing new to say about it, why are we still performing it? Um, is sort of my feeling, and uh, yeah. So I think Jamie Martino's reckless, uh, traditional to the point of being reckless, is what I is what I carry with me as a director on that front. I don't want to. I don't want to change the conversation because uh, I, I know Doc has something brilliant to say about about this. And when when uh, Aria was speaking, it. Margaret, the opera Margaret Garner jumped into my brain. And when violence is necessary to tell the story, um, you know, I, I've, I've, I've sung Michaela and, it, and it's always disturbing for me to see the end of the opera, of course, you know, for Carmen and everything. But then I then then I start to think about and, and you know, I, I am not a blow up the can in person. Um, that's how I came to opera. And so I just say we just have to be smarter and we just reimagine it. Unfortunately, we don't have the resources like Europe to put on productions that make absolutely no sense <laughs> to the audience. <laughs> and every board member hates it. You know, like we, we we cannot just put up anything and just say it's art, you know, because we are, uh, you know, for profit and we, we need the support of the community. But when I think about Margaret Garner and you see her murder her children on the stage and you see her go to hung at the end because she is found guilty for destroying property, um, both acts of violence uh, from the people and of, of her, but it's that's when is it necessary to tell that kind of story? And I think that that's probably the reason why that story hadn't, hasn't been, I think that opera is a brilliant opera and I think that everyone should, I think that we may be ready now to, to, to see 
maybe maybe not whatever i think it should be done more frequently um and in a new imagined way but i don't know why that popped in my brain is when do we see, when the woman is the violator especially of a child like you know and then you and then you see her at the end being hung which is which is violent you know, but it's necessary. You cannot leave that out of that of that story. So I just I don't want to shift the narrative or any or change it, but I just thought that it was important. That just came to my spirit. So I wanted to say that. That makes a, a lot of sense to me. And I like how these conversations we're having right now are moving things a little forward, sort of moving in things that are a little less expected. Because one of the issues of performing works and performing opera is that we get to enjoy or learn or feel deeply something that is going to bring us to another place. If this is a place that is replaying things that maybe our culture is moving past, the exoticism so much of Carmen and how as colorful and enticing she is, she needs to be snuffed out at the end, you know, to let a woman do that, to let, you know, and be, and to say, you know, no, I'm, I'm done with you, sorry, goodbye, that she can't be, survive the opera. Or to have an opera where, like Margaret Garner is that's I got to see it twice when it was um, in its first season at Detroit now Detroit Opera um, they've just changed their name from Michigan Opera Theater to Detroit Opera and um, then when it came back I think in 2009 2010 and it is hard both times seeing that final scene and in both times the audience when they just see her because they somehow string her up really well and you're just like <gasps> and I get it that we need to see it and it's also you know I remember when I first saw it and I saw her kill her children on stage and I'm like oh whoa we are not used to seeing <laughs> We do not kill children on stage. If something bad happens, you know, with Yanufa, that's off stage, or you know, that happens even with Butterfly, or you know, and she doesn't kill her kid, but yeah, it's like that. The violence happens off stage, and to have it on stage, I think you're right, Karen, that there's something very brutal that we need to confront. <sighs> Yeah, it's just hard. Violence on stage. How much violence do we watch? What does it mean to have somebody from today reenact those stories from the past? It's one thing in 1904 to have Madama Butterfly, you know, fulfilling those exotic fantasies, but to ask somebody today to do that, I think that's asking a lot of singers. I think there's sort of extra trauma we're putting singers through, not that it didn't do it before, but now we have more of a language to talk about it. Now we have more of a resistance. I love what you said, Aria, with this idea of saying, no, this is our intervention, not, not in this opera for the end. I, and I, I guess I understand why some people haven't said, you know, like the companies haven't agreed to, but I really, really like that. How do we do Butterfly today? I don't know how to do Mikado, um, which is, you know, in a related Gilbert and Sullivan genre. What works today and what doesn't regarding racial ethnic representations regarding violence to women? How do we open the beginning or, you know, early on in Don Giovanni? Is this, you know, a rape? Is it something? And this just freaks me out when productions try to make it seem as though Donna Anna wants this and she's asking for it. And it's like, oh my Lord. Yes. Oh, Karen, good point. Uh, bring this up. Oh, the opening of Dead Man Walking, where you see you see the actual act of murder and rape. And I have a huge problem with rape. I don't like it. Uh, I, I, not that anyone likes it, but you know what I mean? Like, I, it, it's very disturbing for me. Um, and I've done seven productions of Dear Man Walking. And every time that opening scene, you have to see it. You have to see it in order to have, in order to understand, I think, the confessional and understand the end. You know, um, maybe some people don't feel like you have to see it, but I just, it's very, it's, it's changed me 
to see that, to be a part of it, to, you know, as the role of Sister Rose, who is the, who is the friend of the boss of Sister Helen, you know, and how she's got a Sister Helen's got to get Joe through this, um, you know, through death row into the, into the end. I mean, it is, but unless you see the act, the investment is just not the same. How do you protect yourself when you do it? When you, cause me, I get to go to the opera once, twice, you know, I'm never required to go to the full run. Sometimes I want to, but you, if you're in it, that's a different thing we're asking of the people on stage. Well, I, I have to give kudos to the directors who don't let anybody see the rehearsals. And that's very important is that you don't see it until final dress. I mean, sorry, final room run. Um, so I've had that for the directors because they don't want to sensationalize it. And it's hard, it's hard for the dancers who are playing the chill, the kids and remind these are kids, they're young, they're teenagers. They're not grown people that, that get murdered by Roche and, and his brother. But um, it's hard for me. And it's hard for me as Sister Rose to, to tell Helen that she's got to forgive him. And she's, that's how she gets to, you know, you have to go to him in a way so that he trusts you and you have to forgive him in order to give him to get him to confess. Like, again, that's not yeah. Karen, you know what I mean? That's like the beautiful, wonderful Sister Rose, but it is a struggle. It's hard. It is hard. Like traumatic things are hard. You know, when you do new, I didn't like breaking waves when I saw, I think it was a Philly, it was on TV and I was just like, oh my God, like, and I know uh, Kara and I was just like, no, you know, like the idea of like all of those things, they just personally, um, I, it, it, it makes me um, very, very uncomfortable and, and really invoke, and I haven't had to play roles like that. Not saying that I wouldn't, because again, I enjoy being able to go in and find the, and, and, and just tell every story. Every story deserves a, a, a place in my opinion. Um, but it is hard. It's traumatic. That's why I stopped doing it. I don't do the rule anymore. I was like, yeah, I'm done. Seven is seven's the lucky number. I'm done. I don't, I don't need to do it anymore. And that's, that's fine. But it is a, it's a hard opera because it also talks about death, death, the death penalty. And that is, a I know on both ends you get it. I mean, it's not like there's ever an easy moment in that work. Absolutely. And I've done it in Canada and in America, very different places. Like, you know, the opinions are very different and in and, and different states, the different state you do it in, people have opinions about all of those things. And so it's, it's very, it's, it's, it's interesting and hard trauma. No one, no one tells you as, as a performer, how to make it through this career, embodying these parts. Or, you know, going from person to person, from opera to opera, or whatever, life. Like, and then now it's all about realism, right? You can't just stand and sing anymore. You really have to live and breathe and sacrifice your voice in certain situations to tell these stories. That's what's required of the, of, of I think, of the art now. And so no one, no one prepares you for, I don't think, for that. That is such an important topic. I love these topics that are coming out of our conversation. How do we, and it's one that you, Karen, can talk about. Me, as somebody who's in the audience or who tries to recreate the contextual history and all of that, but what, it, and I'm very aware that art, performing arts and opera is asking people to do it now, as opposed to a picture on the wall or a novel, um, you know, where it's, it doesn't change, it's not performing, whereas you are doing it. What does it mean? This is reminding me of a conversation I remember having in um, a department meeting in women's and gender studies where there's, we have a, a strong medical um, unit that um, with gender and health, and we have some practicing doctors and nurses. And there was a, a, a conference that was talking about sort of how do we support the doctors who are performing abortions mm -hmm. and how their own, like they fervently believe in a woman's right to choose. And yet you're going to a place where the clinics are being, um, you know, bombed or at least picketers or something and sort of the trauma for these people who are working on those really difficult front lines. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, I'm not, I, I think, 
putting these two types of things in conversation with what we have our performers doing on stage night after night. That's just, you know, and reliving it, there's almost a weird spectatorship consumption of the audience. Like how real did you go? Or, yeah, it's just an interesting thing to talk about in opera, the opera world. One thing I can add is that in the theater world, um, there has been some research into portraying trauma on stage. And I'm just struggling to remember my sources right now. <laughs> um, but there's um, a trauma spiral uh, and trauma informed staging that sort of like helps people position themselves. It's something I, it's an article I send to actually young directors who I, I interact with, who are looking with like, how, how do I approach this scene? Um, just to sort of, and keep, and work with singers and keep, keep them, allow them to engage with the, the obviously traumatic material in a way that is manageable and not necessary, and allows them to do the work, but also protect themselves as individuals. So there's, um, Man, I wish I could remember what who had authored that beautiful article that I send out all the time. But uh, I do remember it's the trauma spiral is is one of those uh, one of those articles. But I think you're absolutely right. Um, compassion fatigue and uh, secondary. Maybe yeah. maybe there's a bibliography we could have. You know, you could find <laughs> it afterwards, and it can be added on there totally. because that sounds like I want to read that. I want to know. <laughs> So, and Karen, you bring, and, and Aria, you both have this positioning in um, opera where you do it again and again to get it better and better, you know, quote unquote, better and better. And yet it's at, it's at the, um, the price. I, I know that there are also intimacy coaches that are out there now. And so I'm wondering, I think that's really smart to protect the folks who are our artists. One of the um, pillars of, and this is sort of would have been my my general response to what you two were both discussing, but um, one of the pillars of intimacy directing, and and I don't have any, I'm I'm not an intimacy choreographer, but I've read their materials. But context is really important. So understanding exactly why, as Karen, you say exactly why we're doing what we're doing and what function it's serving the story and what function it's serving in the takeaway is really important to getting into intimate scenes. And I would say also these when we're portraying trauma. Um, like the interesting thing, like the the maddening thing about a show like Carmen is the trauma happens right at the end the it's not clear what we're supposed to take away in most cases we're like did car like are we supposed to take away that carmen like pushed don jose to the brink like is that really what we want the takeaway to be here or are we supposed to be like this is a very bad person <laughs> like but it's like not always clear what we're supposed to understand from this you know um we in i think of like the rape of lucretia for example uh, we don't we don't really see anything happen to Tarquinius. We are told it very quickly, but it's not like, it, and we're like, oh, that was bad, but it, it, that's not really the image we're left with on stage um, is not. And so the takeaway, we're like, what are we supposed to, a lot of times I'm like, why am I watching this violence? And I think that's the difference is when we understand in, in a show like Dead Man Walking, where we're, we're we're really challenging our understanding of what justice is um, and, and acknowledging that, you know, um, I, I perceive that there is a intersection of the hashtag me too movement um, and like movements that are calling for defunding the police where it's like, how do victims and survivors of sexual assault and violence um, experience justice? in this current system that we have. And that is, I think, a conversation that's really, like Karen says, really uncomfortable, um, really challenging, and something that's so necessary to have as we work towards a better society. So we should be having these conversations and we should be showing, like, we should be showing how just like deer in headlights, a lot of people are at tackling these kinds of, of discussions. And so these shows are so worthy on, in so many ways, um, but yeah. I don't think the point should be, we were like, that was a beautiful death. Like that was a beautiful trauma, which is what it often is in opera, which is just like, oh, I think the right reaction is one that um, builds learning, challenges, like grows empathy, 
um, offers a new perspective, lets us sit in discomfort. Um, I often say, I think we're, we're not profitable because we're not expected to take, tell the stories that will earn us that are easy to digest and easy to mm. swallow. Um, mm. If we are not for profit, we acknowledge that we're not turning a profit. And so either we're telling easy stories and we're just incentivizing irrelevance because we're not profitable and they're easy stories or <laughs> we're telling <laughs> stories that challenge our communities um, and we acknowledge that they won't always be easy to digest and things that people are running to the theater to go see and if that's the case then we should sometimes sometimes we can laugh like I would love a comedy <laughs> every now and then oh. but sometimes we should leave the theater feeling really challenged and I think that's a really huge value of what we do um, potential value of the work that we do in opera. You know, that leads me to this um, thought that there are certain characters on the opera stage who make you feel sort of like, oh, this is exciting, this is wonderful. And um, sorry, I'll just sort of cut something now, but um, I, I was trying to, Lily, I, I know time is probably getting close. And so I was going to lead into a character who I really want to see more of in the opera. And that was with Janine Tesori and Taswell Thompson's Blue and how there's a mother who I feel like that's me. So um, sorry, I th that's what I was putting in my head, but I'm like, wait a minute, you're the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> this is your show. <laughs> Feel free to take over. Um, no, that's, that's great. But we, yes, I would love to just continue this conversation for hours. I think so many interesting and important things are coming up that we, we are um, just about at, at time. Um, <clears throat> so I wonder if, if anyone has any very brief um, final comments. Um, Naomi has already um, offered you know, a character she would like to, to see presented more. Um, Arya and Karen, do you have any characters who you would like to see presented more, either who have already been written, like the mother in blue, or who have yet to be um, written about um, in the operatic repertory? I'll briefly just say, the since, since um, Doc mentioned the mother in blue and I I've now gotten to the point where I'm like where the hell did I go in my career where I'm playing moms now because I created the Billy and Fire shut up in my bones and I've played uh, the Imelda and Champion and I've done uh, Charlie Parker uh, one performance of that the mother and like you know and um the drunk and, and driving Stella and Margaret Garner you know black mothers and I'm like I would like to play women I want to tell my own story that's what I want I want to see more women of color to have their own narrative and not just be somebody's mother, girlfriend. But like, I don't want to support the man's story. I want my own story. You know, that's what I want to see oh, more. Yeah. more okay, so do you want to go first? Do you want me to go? Oh, and Aria, Aria, go. Go, Aria's got to talk. No, <laughs> we, oh my we gosh, no. We choreograph this so we're not just like, oh. <laughs> Who's no, I, I mean, I think I'm right with Karen. I think just generally I think we just need more stories and I'm eager to see those stories told from the perspective of the people that they're meant to represent like I I have very I have very little interest in seeing stories that where the per, a person has no sort of frame of reference for the characters they're writing anymore and I think we I think it's been shown through works that the what we get when we invest in just telling just all the stories from all the different perspectives and all we get more nuance um we get more um we we get to see more complexity we get more like richness from the stories and like it's a volume thing like just get all the stories <laughs> out yeah. there, in my opinion ready for more. <laughs> yeah like that's 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 my my feeling I just want all the stories from all the perspectives out there let's just yeah, so simple. Let's just make it happen tomorrow. <laughs> it's my feeling. Here we go. Yeah. Because the opera's quick. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so fast. <laughs> just put it out there. <laughs> so one thing I'm really interested in with all these women we've talked about, I saw an opera recently, and I actually was fortunate to be able to see it here in Detroit, and then again at Seattle Opera, and that is Blue, the opera by Janine Tesori and Caswell Thompson that was um, 
commissioned by uh, Glimmer Glass Opera. And one reason why I love that opera, just totally selfishly, is it's a two act opera. And for the first act, it was just fun. <laughs> I, you know, love the opera. I go to the opera all the time when I can. And for the first time, I felt like jumping up on the stage and saying, hey, me too. Like, I'm, you know, let me play. I want to be here. I just love these smart Black women. And they are giving the mother a hard time. And she's like, who'd you meet? You have not been in touch with me. And you're married and pregnant. And what? And they just like tell it to her. <laughs> I love that. And even though it's an opera where the second half is really tough and difficult, that first half is so, it's funny. It's great. I love laughing at the guys, you know, when they're watching the football in the pub and he's trying to say, I just had a son. I mean, it is, I want operas that are telling new stories and that where I feel like, oh, I could do this. You know, I, I love Marriage of Figaro, and I think the Countess is so elegant, and I want to be somebody who can be that dignified. And but the mother in blue, oh man, she's like got it going, taking care of business, changing diapers, doing it all. That's the woman I want to hang with. So, in terms of who do I want to see on the opera stage, a little selfishly, I want to see more of me. <laughs> Amazing answers. And I, I hope that that all of this comes to fruition and we see more more of you and more of Karen and all the stories like Aria wants, just all the stories um, it would be be really, really great. Um, so thank you so much to all of you for this wonderful conversation. I have so many things that I want to follow up on with all of you and new pieces to look into and, and different ways of, of thinking about things. And I'm sure that <clears throat> our audience watching will, will feel similarly. Um, so thank you all for your time and your thoughts. Um, and I hope we can continue this conversation sometime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lily.